Welcome to the Buy Box Bandits Podcast. Episode 32 of Buy Box Bandits. Thank you guys for listening, viewing, watching all that. We have one of the first Amazon sites I've actually ever ran into back in the day about three years ago. Wow, over three years ago at this point. The title was like, Guy Travels the Country with Canoe on the Top of His Thing sleeping out of his car, selling books on Amazon. Romer the Romer, a uh, VIP guest. We've been trying to get him on a while. Busy schedule, South Africa, Connecticut, Alaska the past few months. But lucky he's back in Florida. We can record with them today. So Avery, thanks for being with us, man. 100%. Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. It's been a couple of years now. You know, I remember uh, you were also like one of the first people that had a following that responded to me back in the day. And that would have been in 2019. So I guess... Yeah, like two and a half, almost three years ago. But okay, so take us back to the origin story of what you were up to back in the day. Um, you know, the homelessness, the book selling, all that. And then we'll yeah. kind of later get into what you're up to now. I'll try to keep it under 60 seconds. <laughs> so I uh, started my business flipping books. Right here, we got books um, from my college dorm room. Um, started selling my textbooks. Then I started selling my friends' textbooks. And then Friends of friends, random people on college campus, they would all come to my dorm room. I would pay them cash for their books. And ironically, like I, I didn't expect to go to college to learn how to sell on Amazon, but that's how it worked. I started selling my own textbooks, my own really just textbooks starting out. Then online, I saw people going into thrift stores, libraries, just scanning stuff. And I was like, I thought it was a scam. I was like, there's no way these dudes are actually making money. Um, but I, I had to watch their videos to learn how to make FBA shipments and all that complicated stuff. So I was kind of like immersed in the thrifting side of things, but I thought, I thought it all was fake. And then um, during that summer, I gave it a shot, had my landscaping company that I started after college. I was taking a gap year. I was going to go to physical therapy school, um, which is going to cost probably close to a hundred thousand. Um, and I already had student loans to pay off. And so then I had like a quarter life crisis. I was like, I don't want to go to graduate school um, for three more years because I know once I graduate, I'm going to get a job and then pay off this debt. And the responsible thing to do would be pay off the debt rather than have my parents pay for it or try and start a business. I always knew I wanted to start a business. I didn't want to start a business while having all this debt. And I knew a business required going more into debt, you know, so starting a physical therapy business is what I would be doing if I had a you physical therapy. Would, that would have been, imagine doing that like digitally based though, like that could have been sick. You know what I mean? There was this dude I followed, uh, Greg Todd's his name. He's got a little niche audience. And um, I, I knew that I was going to do something like how he did it. I mean, he sells information. I sell information now. Mm. Um, he's got so many clinics set up all over the place. Like this dude like systematized it. And I was like, he's really good at marketing. I was like, that's going to be me if I become a physical, th physical therapist. And I also knew that because I'm more of like a, a business person, business minded person, I'm not going to need the clinical uh, knowledge that I learned at school because I'm not going to be practicing. I'm going to be building a business. That's such a good point. And I think we're at such an advantage, like me, you, some of these other guys, like Steve and everything that we're, we're not just like resellers, right? There's a marketing perspective to it, which lets you transcend just Amazon selling clearly, you know, doing this content side of things. And I think pe the people who go into these, all these different types of businesses that have a marketing component to them, or are willing to learn, like, I mean, I learned, you know, lots of studying Russell Brunson, and all that stuff. Um, have such an advantage in different things because they transcend just the that one you know, that, that commodity you know what i mean because reselling is a commodity right all that yeah. stuff yeah 100 percent marketing more more sales. Say it again? i said it just makes the income more diversifiable you take your amazon income turn it into a brand turn it into a community that you can inevitably monetize down the line yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and it doesn't just have to be creating an amazon based teaching brand like what you guys are doing and what i'm doing um, you even get like watch me Amazon who picks up the phone and he calls different wholesalers or distributors, whoever he's calling. And he's like, Hey guys, by the way, my Instagram is watch me Amazon and they'll find him. And that's his brand equity. And it's not even like, he's not even using his brand equity to teach people how to sell on Amazon. He's doing that, but he's also doing it to build brand equity the other way to sell his Amazon business as well. So, I mean, just having sales skills in general, being able to pick up the phone, talk to people, uh, understand pain points and all that. Like you just learn that through posting on social media. Yeah, it really lot. teaches you to think long term, right? Because no one gets paid off their first post. 
or even just off any post here besides like YouTube videos, whatever, but thinking that I'm going to invest time into this, into meeting people, into growing and not ask for money now, maybe ever, or at least not fully. You know, I, I talk about how the most money I've made off of like content is the people I've met, like doing different things with them, you know, masterminding all that. And it teaches you about scalability too, because there's certain things that are hyper scalable, building software, hyper scalable, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people can use one software and it doesn't take any more physical resources to maybe it takes a little bit more computing power, but it doesn't take any more physical resources for me to scale my book business. hundred X, I have to find a hundred times more books, which is possible with the power of Amazon FBA. It actually makes it very uh, easy because Amazon's doing all the work. I still have to find a way to get the books to Amazon though, you know? And so my invoices paying for prep get very big, very fast. Uh, if I'm going to a hundred, hundred thousand times my business, but you could have a viral Instagram post, TikTok post. You could have a software where hundreds of thousands more people are using it. And you're not going to stress your systems too much at all. You know, your, your personal brand can just skyrocket and your day-to-day doesn't change at all. You know, you don't have to be packing more books. You don't have to be physically um, doing anything else. You might have more DMs, you might have stuff like that, but those are good problems. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so I kind of, after I interrupted you there, but so you were thinking about going to physical therapy school, obviously yeah. you decided not to. Yeah. So, so then I was like, you know what? Cause I, I shadowed physical therapists that summer and I said, I was going to keep this under a minute. And now it's like, <laughs> we're like 15 minutes in. Um, I, and I was like, I, I would shadow them and, and I didn't really like it too much. I didn't like being around the physical therapist maybe it was because i did it in like really small towns i did it outside of nashville and i did it in the middle of nowhere in kentucky and so like the patients were like these old women old men nothing against old women or men but like i was just like this is so boring like i cannot be doing this rest of my life so then i was like why not just do what i've always done like wrestle and make a living from that so then i decided to coach wrestling and I poured my heart and soul into it. And for three months, I coached wrestling and I put like at least three to four hours a day into that. Gave up my, my weekends, eight to 14 hours a day on the weekends at wrestling tournaments. And that was my passion. That's what they tell millennials to do. Millennials are all about following your passion. And I made $1,000 in three months. And that's when I was like, this is not feasible. Um, I want to at least, at least right now. Yeah. You know, at least that, the for, way I for financial rewards. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, I'm, there's people that do it, man. There's people that make a living off their passion. Didn't work for me. So then I was like, I'm going to travel the world. I'm going to start with America. I don't have any money, but I'm going to do it. So I took my Toyota Corolla, took the front seat out, put a bed down, put a wrestling mat on top of the bed uh, from the school that I worked at, took one of the wall wrestling mats that they had laying around and um, put a sleeping bag down. And I traveled to like almost every state in america except for and alaska this Hawaii. is all on on youtube by the way boys and girls like once once a year i'll like go but i might go back and binge it today but there's these <laughs> funny ass videos of avery like my, i guess my right like right out of school um and it's literally just three years ago um like here's here's like the newspaper i put over the windows like stuff like that you guys <laughs> yeah. ought to go like go go look back at it but you, you were saying yeah. Yeah. So I traveled the country and I, I would go into, I didn't know what I was doing selling books at the time, but I uh, started, I learned everything on that trip. I would go into thrift stores, libraries, to just scan books. I got better at it as time went on. I would ship, ship them all to Amazon FBA. I didn't do this. I wasn't like thinking this is going to be my business, like, you know, in three to five years, but it, it turned out to be because uh, I post on social media a lot, grew a social media following and I started a business called RestrictedInventory.com uh, in 2019. And now Amazon sellers who are restricted in, let's see, I got a textbook right like here. Pretty much everyone out there. Yeah. So I started selling textbooks in 2014, I think. And so my account could sell these textbooks that most people can't. Oh, that's an expensive one. That looks brand new too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it looks expensive. It's torn here. So Amazon oh, that's told, a like new. Yeah, that's a like you new. You can't right sell there. it as new if it's if the shrink wrap's torn. But if you take the shrink wrap off, you can sell it as new. <laughs> so you just got to take the shrink wrap off. And um, yeah, yeah, in our other episodes, we talk about on gating being very feasible for lots of categories like clothing, toys, beauty, grocery, all that. But textbooks is uh, pretty much impossible I've to my knowledge. If you have the option, this is new. You can get on gated in McGraw Hill. 
if oh, you which is one yeah, of the bigger so, brands. Like, the order is going to have to be at least a thousand to get ungated. Um, oh, okay. I it wonder doesn't if you have could... to be at least a thousand, but it's very difficult to keep the order under a thousand because you have to get brand new McGraw Hill textbooks, and mm. they are expensive. I wonder what the so, refund policy is, though. If you could just pull the, take the invoice and then return them. Yeah, well, we did. Oh. We we just we uh we sold them, so mm-hmm. we got a lot of our money back. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. But yeah, maybe you could do that. And so then restricted inventory popped off. And I did like an 80,000 sales month, which at the time was just like ridiculous for me. And I was like, holy crap, like this is what I should be focusing my time on. And I focused and focused the next couple of years on uh, restricted inventory. And here I am today. Yeah. And the, the, how are you getting these restricted books? They're all from my Instagram audience, YouTube, Facebook, booksellers that can't sell them. They send them to me. Booksalefinder.com ads. You have? Yeah, booksalefinder.com. What'd you say? How many active clients do you have in your in your network? Uh, well, we have. Members? That's actually a metric I'm trying to build out this week. So we have 2,000 people who have signed up for my service. As far as how many of them are active, I don't know. I'd say maybe 10%. Mm-hmm. I, okay. I want to build a metric that shows how many people have sent me inventory in the last month uh, out of the whole user base. That way I know how many people are currently active. So currently working on that. Interesting. Yeah. And so you basically built that all off the back of your social media following that you kind of yeah. blindly just went to. I kind of, kind of did the same way. I kind of saw the way you guys, you know, were doing different stuff back then and kind of just tried to make it my own and everything. And that was, you know, one of the better decisions I made, obviously, you know, Gary V hammering our years about doing it and everything, but it's clearly pays off if you, you know, stick with and everything thinking like, you know, me and you've been around a couple of years. Well, all of us have been around for for a couple of years and very, very few people have posted every day. Like I would say less than 10, you know what I mean? Yeah, less than, like yeah. less than 10, 20. And I feel like not like, you know, being super like elitist or, but like the people who have done that, you know, good things are happening. You know what I mean? Off that yeah. consistency, off all those relationships and everything. hundred percent. And, and just to go back to the power of social media is like, you never know what's going to come from it. I, people are like, oh, you're so smart. Like, how'd you come up with that business model? Like, oh, that's genius. And I'm like, it literally just happened. Like it was luck. Me seizing the opportunity. Yeah. Maybe I'm, maybe I deserve some credit for that, but it happening was complete luck. Like there was several circumstances that had to occur with my social media following in order for me to even realize it was an opportunity. And if I didn't post on social media at all, I never would have even realized it was an opportunity. You know, even if I didn't post on social media, it's still an opportunity, but I wouldn't know about it if I didn't post. And you wouldn't media. have, you wouldn't have had customers to so easily require with yes. to validate the idea that quickly. That's what it really comes down to. My, uh, Ty Lopez actually said that like something, some interview, he was just talking about how easy it is to validate an idea when you have a following. And that's yes. clearly an example of that. Yeah. hundred percent. you options. Definitely. And there's something to be said just about surrounding yourself with winners, right? Associating with winners each and every day, even if you're not at that scale, it's just being susceptible to that sort of mindset. It's super yes. contagious. Yeah. And just people doing the same thing, right? Cause it's impossible. Like you talk to people walking down the street, like no one's heard of selling on Amazon. They think it's just Amazon just being a monopoly and they don't know that 50% of the items bought on it come from third-party sellers and all that. So it just uh, kind of necessary. It makes it a lot more fun. I pretty much say it every single episode, but it just is super, super necessary to be in the community because opportunities come to you that you wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, 100%. And you can start from scratch too. You can start literally from nothing. You can pick up books. You can pick up items around your house. That's what I say. Just, yeah. You just don't know what it's going to turn into, you know? I, I had no idea. I had no intention of even building it to this point. I knew I didn't want to work a regular job, but I didn't know selling books on Amazon was going to be my out. At what point in your journey, obviously you had the $80,000 month. At what point as you were scaling restricted inventory, do your parents start to realize, oh, this could be something legit. And like your close inner friends start to kind of see what I think was it was going actually on. before it was before restricted inventory took off. It was, uh, I was traveling a lot. There was uh, there was these liquidation deals that were happening with textbooks, and I was going across the country. I drove from St. Petersburg to Waco, Texas. I drove to Washington D.C. 
then I stopped by Steve's house on the way up and shot some content with him. Um, but I was like making several thousand dollars a day doing that. And my family thought I was making it the first year. I thought I was making it the first year. I did 80,000 in sales my first year. And well, my the year, like, oh. the year before that. Oh yeah. Remember you lost all that money textbook investing. Yeah. And I didn't even really realize it. I didn't realize it at the time. I made some time, crazy mistakes like that. The exact yeah, same. Yeah. I, if you would have asked me it, like, I'll be like, Oh yeah, we're going to make a bunch of money off these books. And even after it happened, I'm like, yeah, I think the money's going to come. I didn't realize what happened really until several months later when I like, got smacked with reality that I had a bunch of credit card debt. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, <laughs> like I would take loans out to pay for my rent. I, I, when I moved out of my parents' house, I took a few like cabbage loans. I, I used to go to advanced financial down the road and get, wow. uh, get money and pay like 20% on it over the course of a couple of weeks. Like it was, it was bad, but I knew I just didn't want to live at home. For me, it was a psychological thing that I didn't want to be not not be not be around my parents but like you were just yeah, saying like, you, live you just close. surround yourself yeah. with people of a different mindset yeah. for my parents it was work a job that's how you make a living and they, they've never been opposed to what i'm doing but i knew for myself i needed to move out like that was 90 percent of it and, and it's really it. hard it's really hard to visualize and understand the business model in general like wait why do you talk to people about how to do exactly what you do isn't that going to create yeah competition? there's so yeah, many mental frameworks that have to change or at least and it, it's just difficult to understand yeah and I knew if I took like a I had to take a business loan I think my second month to pay rent and I I just knew I'm like I'm gonna figure this out there's no way I'm not gonna figure this out like I'm gonna figure out how to make money like no matter what and I was just doing everything but one month and I, <clears throat> this is the first time I really leveraged my social media following um selling digital products I didn't have any of my own but Caleb Roth has that tracking spreadsheet in one month, I was like, I need to make $1,200 to pay my rent next month. And um, I didn't have any cash. And I was like, selling on Amazon is not going to work because Amazon takes two weeks to pay out. So I just like, yeah. I just wrote, a, I made a bunch of YouTube videos. I sent my email list that Steve helped me set up. And I sold like twelve to 1500 in tracking spreadsheets. That was enough. Of, of, that was affiliate enough. payout. Yeah, and I, I paid for it. So I was hustling hard, like any way I could ice bathing hard too back then yeah it was <laughs> remember the the bootleg one out my mom actually was just asking me about that the other day because i had a, at a smaller bootleg one um that i was like posting about with you back i guess to yeah two key floors ago so 2019 crazy yeah. times man so what does your day-to-day -day look like now in terms of business other projects all that so i'm on a very interesting flow like this is i feel like i'm on some next level shit right now I'm not as productive as I could be. I know that, but I know that I'm more productive than I was the last few years. And I'm doing it in a way where I'm not like, here's my, let me show you guys. This is my desk that I paid $600 for this desk and I never work at it. <laughs> Such a waste. And I paid $1,200 for a fucking walking treadmill that I never do. Yeah, I was going to say, I, didn't you at some point buy a walking treadmill? Stand? Yeah, it's Any, anything closet. but never, index I, funds. I, I never took it out. I spent a lot of money setting this place up and I don't even really use the stuff except for the ice bath, which I need to start using is I think it's got a giant ice cube in it right now because our thermometer is screwed up. But um, anyway, in 2019 and 2020, I spent most of my time just like four hours every single day. Believe it or not, I used to wake up like 5 a.m. And I, I would just like block out that time, four hours working on the most important thing. And a lot of the tasks I would do looking back at, at it I could have delegated to virtual assistants or somebody else. I would spend, I spent the whole month of January in 2020 learning spreadsheets for my consignment business for restricted inventory, how to pay people, how to calculate the Amazon fees, all that. I spent one whole month in Starbucks very inefficiently. Uh, I was drinking a lot of coffee and I was very inefficiently learning Google Sheets, Excel. I, like I could have learned that shit probably in like two days in a college class with like the teacher back and forth, but because I was doing it on my own, like a street style, of learning, it was it was rough, and I, I could have hired a VA for two dollars an hour to do everything that I needed to do in that one month. So now my brain thinks more that way, and so my day to day looks like this: like I wake up, I drink coffee, I usually go on a walk, I listen to audio books, I try to learn as much as I can. I'm still like in learn, learn, learn mode right now. Usually, I'm learning about something that I need to be doing in my business right now. I'm reading a lot of Dan Kennedy. Uh, learning Ooh, about copywriting. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I, so I had to read that stuff too. Definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm launching the listing software. So I want to make sure that my messaging is correct for that. Um, but now my day to day is just communicating with all my team members. So we're building software. So I communicate with the software team. 
I send voice messages to all my virtual assistants, uh, make sure customer service is doing well. I write down a lot of ideas um, and I just try to focus on the most important thing I can do in my business, which is very difficult to choose. You know, it's very difficult to choose what's the most important thing you could be doing in your business today. So my day to day is like I work when I want to work and uh, most of my work is done like on my phone. And occasionally I open up my laptop and shoot some loom videos, but that's been like the last couple of months have just been like phone work. And I, I love that type of work. Yeah. And you've been traveling. So I'm sure it's hard to build the schedule. Yeah, I've, I've had to adapt to do it that way, but like I'll get inspired at weird times too. And I will just like map out a whole system on my phone. I use a lot of flow charts and then it's really cool now that I understand that I can send it to my team and say, Hey, this is what we want. I want this done within a week because that's how long the project would take. So instead of doing it all myself, they now do it. And it took about what well, took my creativity. And then it took me sitting down for 30 minutes and focusing on the system and then me effectively communicating with the team. And then they're able to execute. Yeah. On it, so. And something I've obviously, you know, we're all trying to get better with productivity and thing, but it really is crazy what you can get done when you, when you'll sit down for like 30 minutes to an hour and just crank stuff out and just what you can learn all that. And I uh, just, yeah, I'm personally I'm working on that a lot. Turn off the notifications. Airplane mode. Oh, yeah. Having notifications in 2022 is that's some crazy stuff. Well, they came out with the, the focus feature on the iPhone, which is clutch. You I, I got it. I'm so addicted to it. I got to have it in like the other room upstairs. That kind of I, um, uh, I'm actually like changing my beliefs uh, on the whole no notifications thing. So, like, I think I learned from Ty Lopez actually in 20. 20- 18 he was like turn off all the notifications on your phone so i never had notifications on my phone but now like i'm seeing my discord which i'm not addicted to at all i actually hate using discord oh you'll getting... love it soon trust me you'll it is so good. I'm, I'm getting more into it's it it's so like, good i used to hate I need it to tr- i keep my discord notifications on because then it reminds me to answer people's questions asana is a tool that we use to build to communicate to build our software project and a lot of times i won't respond to messages but if i'm taking a poop and then I see that my phone vibrates with an Asana message, I'll respond to it in two seconds instead of having to wait a whole day. So like, I'm kind of changing my belief on notifications. I don't have notifications on Instagram or Facebook or anything like that. Yeah. So that's just going to distract Any, me. Anything but on there, you can, can wait for the most. Certain but, I mean, it's what different when you manage a team though, because if something, a bottleneck in your productivity could be you answering a simple question. But yes. When you manage so many people that you, that you do, Right. One of your employees could have a question that could be holding up an entire project. And if well, you didn't that's see that, different. Yeah, that's different. Yeah. That, that's that's most of my flow right now is like I am the bottleneck for not answering the question. So I need to make yeah. myself as available as possible, because right now I'm not too much of the creator of anything other than the ideas. I'm not creating the software. I come up with the system, but I'm not implementing it and, and creating it. The team is. So for me, I need to make sure that they have the good systems to do that but I need to respond to them if they have an immediate question of, Hey, is this the way it should be done? And I've even made systems for my team. Like don't ask me questions. If it's less than 200 bucks, that's from Tim Ferriss, just do it and apologize later. Most of the time you can return something if it's over 200 or under, yeah, under 200 bucks. Um, you can really reverse and it then always like message customers before asking me. And then if you fuck it up, like we'll figure it out. Uh, but our motto is like do stuff first. And then like, don't come to me. Like this, it's my biggest pet peeve when I check like a whole project and like a week later, cause I've been so busy and they're like, oh, we were waiting on your response here. We didn't decide what color to pick. I'm like, guys, just fucking pick any color. <laughs> like it doesn't matter. We can change it. Yeah. It's cool seeing your evolution. At one point you were in the hustle, you were driving around doing books and now your day to day is different, but the overall productivity of Romer's brand of your, of your company is still as productive, maybe even more productive. Yeah. But because you have so many hands in the pot, because your systems are in place, yes. your day to day looks different, but you've evolved in a way that that pulls you out of it. You can go to South Africa and your your day to day, your productivity remains there. 100%. Also, side note, there's uh, this book, Ultra Learning. And I was actually inspired to, to kind of change my ways a little bit. Because I, I read the one thing, and the one thing was a book that, by Gary Keller. Gary Keller is his name, right? The real I, estate guy. I think, yeah. Yeah. So he recommends focusing for four hours a day, which is extremely powerful. If you focus for four hours uninterrupted, don't use a restroom, maybe use a restroom one time, but for four hours, just focus the whole time. And if you have one big problem, I made webinars in four hours, dude. 
complete webinars that would make me thousands of dollars in four hours just focusing. Like, like you can, especially if you're already uh, well versed in whatever you're doing, in four hours you can accomplish so much. That's huge. But for now, what the stage I'm in, I need more communication with my team. In four hours, I can't respond to all the questions and concerns that are going to occur over the course of 24 hours. So I'd rather make myself available, be walking down the street, be able to keep moving projects forward by simply replying to messages that need to be responded to. But in this book, there's this lady, forget her name. Um, he talks about a lot of ultra learners, a lot of people who can learn things really fast. I'm actually going to try to learn Spanish this year. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, it, you had posted about yeah, that. Yeah, I saw that what, four months or something. Four months, yeah. So at some point before the end of the year, I'm going to move to a Latin American country or Spain. And I'm just going to focus solely on learning Spanish. The way you do it is you only speak Spanish in the country. You're not allowed to speak English. Even to my parents, I'm not going to speak English. I'm either going to hire a translator or make my mom. I was going to say, you could probably get a VA just to talk to you. In yeah, Spanish seriously. Like, like it sounds yeah. like super bougie, but like I could probably <laughs> hire someone from Venezuela to, to translate for me for like $2 an hour. Um, Wait, how are, gonna do, how are you going to do content then? I don't know. I thought about that. I'm not sure. I, I Everything I'm doing now is re repurposed. If you look at my page, I'm not yeah. creating too much. So I, I could just do that. I could shoot a lot of content before I go out. Like Yeah, I you, you need to post all the beginner stuff again. None of us post beginner stuff anymore. And it's what helps people the most. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I'll probably spend like a week or, or so just shooting content before. But I have thought about that. And I've also thought about about month two or three shooting Spanish content. So redoing all my content in Spanish. And I think that would be really cool to connect with that community. But anyway, there's this lady in this book. And so these guys are all about learning stuff fast. So learning to speak a new language in three to four months, uh, learning like a completely new skill, blah, blah, blah. But there's this one lady in the book that they talk about. And she learned um, she learned how to how to speak to like she like was really good at math or something. I don't even know. She learned she learned some complex shit. And she like raised five kids. She worked like two jobs. And the way that she was able to learn this stuff was she would uh, sit down for like 10 to 15 minutes, like yeah, nap time for the kids. And she would just focus for like 10 to 15 minutes. And she was able to learn this, these crazy skills. So like, I look at my life that way now, like, especially if I get really inspired and I need to move a business project forward, it's not necessarily learning, but it still requires focus. So for 10 minutes, I will just focus so hard in this one task and I'll make sure everything gets done to where it doesn't need me anymore. And the team or system, whatever, is going to take care of itself. And um, then I can move on to, to something else. So that's kind of how I've been living my life. I get super inspired, work for 10 minutes, work for 30 minutes, work for a couple hours, whatever, and bang shit out. Am I super yeah. loud right now? No, you're good. Oh, oh okay. Good. Super white. Fact. Well, all right. Like, I, I'll, I'm actually coming to Florida in like two weeks. <laughs> um, two minutes to make something. I'm always going to be super white, no matter what. Um, I'm white, especially with this light on me right you, now. You use sunscreen? Yeah, we all are. Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. Just wondering. All right, no, completely yeah. irrelevant to the podcast. But where do you see your workflow and just what you think you'll be doing over the next few years? Are you planning on just zeroing in on what you got going on now? Because that's so I, I'm reading this book. It's called The 12 Week Year. I just finished it today. And really today has been like mapping out the next 12 weeks. So I'm treating the next 12 weeks like a calendar year. And I'm trying to condense my yearly goals into 12 week goals. And I'm, I'm also attempting to be realistic with them too. And I, I, some of the goals are a little bit of a stretch, you know, Grant Cardone, 10 X style. But um, I think most of these I, I can accomplish. Well, so better, better to be too hard on yourself than too soft. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to get in the routine of not accomplishing the goals I set. Cause then I won't take myself as seriously when I set the and goals. What, what are we talking like? Well, business, like everything is everyone, you know, kind of everything priorities and stuff. Oh, <laughs> back to Ty Lopez, health, wealth, love, and happiness. Health, wealth, love. Right, run run happy. us through a couple. Run us through your top three. What are my top three? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, health, your, health, health is probably. priority right now because I've realized like, um, I have like all these other things going for me, but I've had back pain like ever since seventh grade. So I'm just going to focus on figuring this shit out. And I realize like whenever I feel like powerful, my body doesn't hurt. I get so much more done in all levels. Like I'm a better person. I'm nicer to talk to, not as ir irritable. Uh, I move my business forward better. I'm a better leader. And so health is my priority. So I'm working on that. And my health goals are get up to 165 pounds. But I guess the priority really is like 
mobility and flexibility and zero pain, which I've been doing a good job of. Like I've been using, uh, let's see, this little stretch pad here. Stretches out your calves. And I've been like, just making oh, yeah, sure yeah. every night yeah. before I go to sleep, I stretch out. Oh yeah, you, you were on this miles when you came over here. Um, but health is at priority, flexibility, mobility, um, get my weight up to 165, just be stronger. Um, that's, that's like the top. Then the business goals that come in. I mean, like I've been pretty open about this on Instagram, but I have all my business goals mm -hmm. written there. Um, jujitsu dance. Um, but I, for business, I really want to get to the point where restricted inventory is consistently making 50 K net each month. So um, that would be good. That'd be such nice money. Yeah, like we might not think pay. about it. even one fifth of that is more than we all ex we all were gonna make in our careers if we went right. You exactly. know, like one fifth of that a month, or at least the first few years. You know. Yeah. 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 So I netted like 200k last year, and I I want to get to the point where I am making 600k a year. I also spend a lot of money. I I bet on myself a lot, mm -hmm. and I take a lot of stu not stupid, but like in hindsight, I'm like, why why did I do that? uh business risk you know so I, I have a lot of money that i've invested in a software project um the amazon automation thing lost me money last year uh but it might make me money this year um i'm making sure everybody gets their money back whoever didn't get you know their full money so i'm paying out of my pocket for that um so i take a lot of risk you know and i bet on myself a lot so um and i feel like what you do and again, we take different routes. Like you live with your parents, I moved out, <laughs> and like it worked out for you, and it worked oh, out for yeah, me yeah. Like in different ways. You're you're taking all your profit, you're putting in index funds, so you're betting your money on like other people's yeah. businesses. And then what I'm doing is like I'm throwing in all, all these random projects, but I I believe that one day one of these things is gonna blow the fuck up. Oh yeah, you know? clearly, just based on like income wise, even like dude, saving one tenth of that would be more than most people do. You know what I mean? Like yeah. oh, over like twenty years, and obviously yeah. you'll keep scaling and stuff. I max out that raw year. Yeah. Where do so, you see your listing software going in twenty twenty two? What do you think this year? I has want in, in store for it. So over the next twelve weeks, I want to get it completely functional, and I want to get fifty paying members. Is it just for books? Right now, it is. Okay. In, in the future, I've actually thought once we get it 100% good for books, I've thought about reaching out to, to you guys, like the whole unemployment club and making it for, for you guys as well. Um, okay. And then you could, you could have like a book setting and you could have like a everything else setting, or we could even niche down in some other, you know, category where it would really be beneficial to have like a new That'd software cool. for. That'd be really cool. Yeah. Because for books, like there's like, so this much really you cool want. Box. Yeah, it, it's such a unique category. Like, because yeah, you're only do. selling one of each few for the most part, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff. So, like, for for example, like this book right here, I think goes for like 30 bucks. Somebody can fact check me on this. But like if the fourth FBA offer you bought it new? Bucks, you bought it new? I probably did. Oh, okay. I mean, I not that's used. a problem. I just I was gonna say, yeah. I'm gonna look I think it. I scanned it. I think it showed up as 30 bucks one day. Maybe it was a good day. <laughs> But anyway, let's just everyone pretend. three pricers were, were screwing up. Let's pretend that this is 30 bucks. Okay. And uh, you, you, uh, oh, the, yeah, the it only FBA, has one review. I can see why it's expensive. Miles, let him talk. <laughs> <laughs> the fourth FBA offer is 35 and the, the lowest price is 30. As a bookseller, if the demand is there, you can price it at 35 and you can get that sale, you can make an extra five bucks. So the software is gonna price it more strategically, which might waterfall or uh, what's the word for it? It might um, uh, slippery slope. It, it might lead into us having a repricing software down the road. So we do a lot of cool stuff like that. Uh, make sure the, the price is right. But like, that's just like niche for booksellers. And there's like Neato Scan. there's other softwares that are super low key that kind of do stuff like this, but they charge a lot for it. So I'm, what I'm bringing to the market is, is uh, Nobody's like Acceler List, Inventory Lab. They're not doing this for booksellers. So once we create this for booksellers, we could branch into um, shoes maybe. I don't know. Whatever the fuck you guys sell and sell that stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. And like make, make, make an optimized workflow for you guys too. When's your guys Miami lease up? Uh, so Taylor's out. <laughs> yeah. I have a new roommate. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, the lease is up in May. 
Oh, so that's low key coming up. Damn, if that uh the brickle one flew by too. That was obviously in quarantine. So that that yeah, I, I want to get. I don't know if it's gonna be Miami, maybe somewhere else in South Florida, maybe somewhere else entirely. But I want to get an Airbnb, move all my furniture, my expensive ass desk and uh, treadmill, all that, and just pimp out one place to ice bath and make like an entrepreneur Airbnb. And so that, that's where I want to put put my money this year is put it in an Airbnb one that I can live in. And then what I can do is travel for several months and then go, go back home and live in it while I'm not traveling. Dude, it'd be so cool to get a massive mansion to have all of us just come and go and connect. I know for a that, that's the problem is half of us want, half of us want the no state income tax in Florida and the weather. And then the other half of us need the no sales tax to do arbitrage. That's the problem. Yeah. But, the net of it would be some amazing content. <laughs> no, yeah, it would, be. it would be. I'm still down to do that. Like whoever, whoever's serious about it. But um, we are, that's the thing. We have the warehouse in Delaware too. And I know the weather sucks, but the no sales tax is so good. Delegate, bro. Just get some workers in there. No, but no, 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 not that. It's for the arbitrage, like for not having to pay sales tax. In Florida, you pay 7% sales tax. Yeah, but just buy everything yeah. in Delaware or do whatever you're currently no, doing. But like they, there's stuff, addresses can get burned back, you know, like there's, there's certain <laughs> things that just, that can't be done like that. Gotcha. Sounds like excuses to me. I, I guess <laughs> very profitable excuses. <laughs> My sales are terrible today. Interesting. And so just, I think uh, in our last episode, we had a guy who, uh, Nick, who's really successful with virtual assistants as well, similar to you. We had a couple people say that we didn't actually give the full hiring process. So we'd love to hear the Roma, the Roma VA hiring SOP. Yeah, it's possible. super simple. So once you get to a certain level, if you have a main virtual assistant, they should be doing the hiring, not you. <laughs> so that's step number one. I knew you were going to uh, say that. Step two, you, uh, it's, it's a simple process. Like, so what we do is for general positions, we make sure that they at least care enough about the job. So we put the job description out. And that's just onlinejobs.ph. Onlinejobs.ph is what I use. Occasionally we'll use Upwork if it's like something else, but Upwork's free. Onlinejobs.ph is 70 a month. Onlinejobs.ph truly does have some really good um, workers on their platform and they're all Filipino. So if you hire off onlinejobs.ph, you're not going to be paying much for the actual work because money goes really far. I have two people working for me for $1.50 per hour right now. And I talked to a girl recently who's from the Philippines. She lives here in America. And she said, that's really good money because I'm paying like 400 bucks a month. <clears throat> they max out their hours. And uh, she said, that's good money. So anybody that's like, oh, that's unethical to pay $1.50, like they're making more money than like people making $15 an hour here. Okay. So the process is like, ask the question, why would you be a good fit for this job? And if they don't answer that question, like they're out. And because they didn't read it. Yeah, they didn't read yeah, uh, yeah, they didn't yeah, that, that question. And like, I like to send Loom videos where like at the very last half of the video, I'm like, do this, like send me this. And if they don't send that, we know they didn't watch the whole video. And we also have them fill out a spreadsheet and put the colors of the rainbow in the spreadsheet. And so depending on how they send you the spreadsheet, you can kind of tell how much effort they put in. Like yeah. if they didn't color code that shit, like they're out. <laughs> if they color coded it, but put it in the wrong order, they're out. You know, yeah. and so you get, yeah, and you have a YouTube video on this that I actually, use. yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. It, it, I probably like can explain it better in that YouTube video because now I currently don't do this as much, but I think that's the process right there. It's like, we make sure they fill out the rainbow spreadsheet. We make sure they actually answer the question and then we'll pick two people, ran, not randomly, but two people that we think are the best. And then we'll interview them. The VA will. And if it's a super important job, then I will hop on an interview with them after he decides which ones are the best, or he'll record the interviews and send them to me. And I'll just listen to them on a, uh, my phone as I'm like walking down the hall, like 2X speed. And I'll just listen to the whole inter interview. Then you can choose who's the best to work for the job. So we hired like a numbers girl who's fucking amazing. And that was the way we hired her, you know, but we, I've also hired shitty people. Like people like to, people like to be like, oh, I'm the best hire. Or I'm the best, you know, I, I, I can choose the best candidate for the job. But at, at the end of the day, you don't know until you hire somebody. So, but that process helps eliminate some red flags from the get-go. Like if you just put an ad out on any website, onlinejobs.phd.com, Upwork, whatever, and you just go with the first 50 people that message you and randomly select two, I can guarantee you're going to get some shitty results. So at least filter through 
and get to the uh, most qualified person the fastest. And even then you're going to run into some assholes that are just not good, you know, not good people. So that's, that's my philosophy on that. Well, how, yeah, how big is your team right now? How many VAs do you have currently working for you? Um, so restricted inventory has like four, I think, four or five. Uh, we have a video editor. So five, if you include the video editor as part of that team, that's kind of like more Roma the Roma, I guess. BBB, my course business has two. Um, Who's then, doing the Facebook ads for that? Is that the VAs? No, no. We have a guy, I think he's from like UK doing mm -hmm. that um i have one american assistant she helps with a lot uh, but i'm i'm getting better at using my vas to do the task that she traditionally does but she's good at like calling amex negotiating different you know annual fee waiving yeah. the annual fee like we try and waive annual fees every time we can she like makes highly hot, so she knows your social security number they dude my whole like a lot of my team knows it like <laughs> I, I, it was so funny to me back in the day when you were talking about how you didn't have anything so it didn't matter if they knew if they had your social security well like now what i do is like i put my money in places where they can't access it you know like index funds they can't access yeah well, one of my vas can but the rest of them can. <laughs> did, did you have her buy the index funds for you yeah, you were like, "Don't do it." I'm like, "Dude, I trust, I trust him with everything." That's not, all right. That, that the is, only thing, the only thing that I have like, you. and actually, it wasn't even me that was like, "This is too far." It was him that said, "This is too far," because I can change the passwords on any of those things. He <laughs> he, he won't have them anymore. Uh, it was uh, something with crypto, like the the wallet key. It was like the one thing. Oh yeah, the oh, dude, you're that's, so dripping. You're so so so. It's so like stupid. the one thing. That's like the you're one so, thing that I I only the know. Seed everything phrase, else, seed phrase, everything else, they know. Fun you know but um, that, that's so funny that that's hilarious yeah Avery, as, so, as we start to wrap up here can you talk about how you value your time and how you leverage that in order to make your outsourcing decisions like yeah. how you outsource just the daily activities that we know we all know you do yeah so so i i try not to do anything that i don't have to do myself um and even like in my personal life, I try to get people to clean for me. Like this is one day back at my place and it's already a fucking mess like the desk is. But um, I hire a maid. I had a chef for a while, but I found out that that wasn't the most time efficient. Um, I get my meals. Like just like talking about personal life, I try to do everything I can. So like meals prepped. I, I get all my meals prepped by a third party service. Um, get my place cleaned. Um, those are like the two main things in my personal life I optimize. Plus the VAs, I use them. Like I never fill out forms for anything. VAs do everything. Because like, if I'm going to be on my phone, people are like, well, can't you do that in the grocery line? Or like while you're waiting at the grocery store? Number one, I don't have to go to the fucking grocery store because I have all my stuff sent to me. <laughs> Number two, if I, if I am waiting in line somewhere, I don't want to be filling out some like government form or any type of form at all. And, and so I have my VA do that. They know everything about me. Um, and so then what I can do is I can focus on a project like this lady here who learned different languages, like 10 minutes a day. And I can focus on whatever I want for that 10 minutes. So really just everything. Like it's, it's pretty crazy at this point. Um, and it doesn't cost that much. Like if, you, if you hire a full-time assistant, American or maybe not American, but I use my American assistant for a lot of stuff, but at least a VA for $10,000 a year, you can delegate like hundreds of hours of just personal stuff that you, you might think it's not that big of a deal, but oh, how many yeah. times you like, so, so many more people should have VAs for stuff. Like they how many times have you like filled out a form on a website, the credit card doesn't go through for some stupid reason. And then you have to call the credit card company. And you have to call, and, wait like, on hold. Yeah. Dude, it's like an hour of your time done. And so people are like, sometimes I do tasks. Some tasks take more time to tell somebody else to do than just to do them yourself. But my reasoning for, for delegating tasks like that is one out of 10 times some stupid shit's going to happen and it's going to take 20 minutes to an hour to resolve. So I'd rather just delegate even like these stupid things, you know, that most people don't. Um, so that's where I'm at now. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. Um, so everyone that can find you on socials, just Romer the Romer. Fantastic. Yeah, everywhere. All right. It's a shame Danny couldn't make this one, but we'll do another episode sometime. In the yeah. Yeah. I'm as well. I'm available. Yeah. I'm back in America. So what's up? All right. Thank you guys for listening, watching, subscribing if you haven't already on that note. But yeah, we'll see you guys on Tuesday, on Friday. Thanks for having me on, guys. Friday. 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 Absolutely.